In the year 1997, the future is in chaos and turmoil. Mankind is on the brink of extinction. Brave survivors band together and build a time displacement apparatus to receive a signal from a parallel future. This transmission is the Boondicast. to the Boondacast, the podcast that knows what goes bump in the night and recommends they put Preparation H on it. I am your host, Steven. And next to him is the mummy. No, it, it's me, Manny. <laughs> you try. Band-Aid breath. <laughs> The cohortress. The co- yeah, that's right. The cohortress. Man, I got to make a costume of that one day. <laughs> yeah. And also joining us is me, D Rock, world heavyweight, non binary champion. Whoa. And we are continuing the finale of Spooktober. This is a record setting uh, five podcasts in <laughs> one month. <laughs> seriously it's pretty good due to the powers that october started on a thursday and ends on a saturday there have been five saturdays in october so it's been extra juicy Mm -hmm. and the fact that halloween falls on a saturday like and a full moon if this wasn't quarantine time on the first and the 31st that's what makes me really sad is that this Halloween falls on a Saturday. Like, on a normal year, this would be the most bump in Halloween ever. Right. It's a full moon. Fuck, yeah. Full moon on a Saturday. People that's, would be going crazy. That's the recipe for mass murder, but we're not going to have <laughs> mass murder. We're just going to have the normal... Regular murder. COVID-19 style murder. Right. <laughs> yeah. Very sad. Very sad. Um, D Rock, why don't you start us off? What do you want to? Yeah, I'll with? kick off. Um, I I I've got a lot of ground to cover. Uh, because I watched some really fucking awesome movies this week, and I watched a lot of them. I t- I like it was the last week in October, so I was like, fuck it. I'm not I'm not gonna work on anything else. I'm just gonna watch movies all day every day. And that's what I did. And I watched so many and so many good ones. But um I started last weekend. I had uh my action horror day. I decided to watch the entire The Purge series, Whoa. which um that I don't recommend watching all four of those movies back to back. <laughs> so much gun violence, like yeah. just gun violence on top of gun a violence. Lot, a lot. It's so much, and like it really drowns out any like social commentary that they were going for, which I feel like is a really like they they missed such an opportunity with this concept and just making it kind of devolve into a lot like a huge ton of gun violence because there's some really cool stuff about like you know this is this sort of idea to like eradicate the poor so that the economy will improve and like you know people of color are disproportionately affected but like that all that that whole thesis just gets lost in the fucking inundation of gun violence and i was kind of disappointed the purge movies I mean, the thing about it is, is that whatever social commentary they're trying to get, at the end of the day, they want, they're trying very hard to be very stylistically horror. Yeah. So, like, like, yeah, they're totally having a commentary about 
society but then it's just like but guess what we're gonna have people with like light up masks and right. dress in their best cosplay <laughs> to murder, murder yeah. their it's best hard, cosplay murder outfits. it's hard to do an effective social commentary when you care way more about style than substance yes exactly you know i think that it's was there one of the what how was it four purge movies that you yeah four purge against? honestly the first one like all everything they were trying to say in the rest of the movies they pretty much said in the first one yeah and way and way better and more subtly and like it's much more focused and direct and like it's all focused on like this one family in this one house and they kind of get everything in there and then they just try, they sort of try to expound on all those themes throughout the other movies. But again, it's just so much style over substance that it kind of gets drowned out. And there's a whole Purge TV show if you want some more yeah. violence. Yeah, I do want to check that out. I wonder if in, in somebody else's hands other than James DeMonico, if this could be a better, more effective social commentary. Well, I think that they have more diverse directors working on, on the TV show too. There's there's at yeah. least a, a a difference of you know. Yeah, yeah. So I would definitely be willing to check that out. I've been wanting to. Um. We didn't watch any of the Purge movies. That's um, not this not this year. No. Mm. I've been wanting to watch the last one just because I know it's like the prequel of like the first Purge yeah. and how it's specifically about killing off the poor and like minority of america so i thought that one might be but i guess based off your review that's i mean that was the one i was the most excited for too and it is better it's it's way better than the other two sequels um but it still really gets bogged down in gun violence and like I don't know. It, it feels like, I mean, it's, it, it was directed by a black man, which I was also really excited to see that sort of perspective. But I think it was also still written by James DeMonico. So there's, I mean, there's a lot of kind of facile uh, characters that are like almost stereotyped. Like the, the one of the main like protagonists is like the leader of uh, like, drug cartel gang basically and yeah it's just i don't know i mean there's there's some stuff there's some stuff to 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 sink your teeth into but it's still just so stylized and so glorifying of gun violence that it's just really kind of loses its edge we saw something that was political as well yeah we saw repo the genetic opera (laughs) Oh, I need to see that. <laughs> Which postulates that one day the rich are gonna sell us organs and then repossess them, which will result in our deaths. Yes. And, nice. And it, it's it, it. I've I've never watched it all the way through before. I've given up on it many times, and I'm happy that I got all the way through <laughs> this time. Um, it's very fun. It's very silly. It's probably the best performance of Paris Hilton's career. Yeah. Yeah which is saying a lot because she's singing i i think it's just repo is it's such a i i have to i like it just specifically for the amount of balls that it has to do with mm. it. because it really embraces the musical genre yeah and because it's almost entirely sung it has it mixes a bunch of different musical styles it's you know, it was it was based off of a um, a stage play that this mm. guy, the guy who wrote it, did. Um, I think he also is the star. He's also the the crypt keeper guy, oh. um, the grave robber. Um, but he wrote this like uh, you know um, just indie musical, and then off 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 Broadway. Well, yeah, um, and then Darren Lynn Boozman got interested in it. Um, yeah, Terrence Zudnick, and he's the one who plays the grave robber, and um, he got interested in it from seeing it, and he said, let's make it into a movie, and then I just, I think that's, I don't know, I, I miss, I miss the times where it feels like people actually take risks and stuff, and so I think Genetic Opera was definitely a risk. Obviously, 
it was you know very it didn't it didn't go crazy and but it's a, I think it's a cult hit now like yeah. I think you talk about mm-hmm. it it's a yeah. cult hit. and I appreciate it and I, I I love it I think it's yeah I think that's there's something to be said for like I mean with any any genre but especially with a horror movie like it, it, no whatever you do if you do it like all the way like go for broke with it you're gonna make something that's gonna appeal to people yeah and then we followed that up with the ultimate um horror musical which also is kind of about the the struggles of the poor little shop of horrors nice it is um which i hadn't seen in a really long time and like every single aspect of that movie holds up so well there's nothing about it that is like dated in like an 80s way it has like a very even the special effects for the 80s are like whoa no um audrey too the puppet that puppet is so amazing like yeah to this day it's still so spectacularly done they you know they have the singing voice but the, the people who who moved that puppet gave it so much personality it doesn't even have eyes so yeah. it's like all that personality is coming from the voice from the lips and from mm-hmm. the leaves and it's just so well done like yeah. wow i was just- I, I, I saw a stage production of it uh, a few years ago and the same thing true like the 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 puppeteering of the 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 giant you know f- fly trap or whatever was like I mean that's that's the star of the show you know yeah. and I just I think it's just I'm I was looking at it and I was just like wow I can't believe this is like Rick Moranis is like only musical thing mm-hmm. he's not a musical person yeah it was like a role they cast him specifically in the movie and and like his voice is so good. His voice mm. is so good. I can't believe he didn't go on to do more stage stuff. And Steve Martin is so fantastic. Yeah, he is. So yeah, fantastic. He, he he steals the movie, but yeah, everybody else like really just just shines. Like even they mm-hmm. have like a musical, um, like sort of a Greek chorus that like shaboops and shabops. Yeah, yeah, the way along, and they're fantastic through every yeah. song. So I really enjoyed that. We had a whole musical day and we also watched uh, Nightmare Before Christmas. Yes. Ah, yes. It was always fun. Um, That's a great like November 1st movie also, the transition from like Halloween to like sort of like Christmas season. Cause that's, that's like a, I mean, what is it? Is it, is it a Christmas movie or is it a Halloween movie? Like that's a, that's kind of a hot debate, right? you decide yeah right exactly it's whatever you want it to be i just you know i just all film is the same to me (laughs) (laughs) material owned by a giant conglomerate yeah wow boom um we closed our musical day with watching hocus pocus nice is equally timeless and entertaining and as danny says an extremely horny movie. It is a very horny movie. Oh, I, forgot nice. how, I forgot how horny that movie is. Because it's like the whole thing about the virgin to have a virgin and and then like Sarah Jessica Parker's witch is seduces children. Seduces children, seduces oh, young shit. boys, like she's just she's she is she's kind of like the slutty witch. Like <laughs> there's no other she's like the slutty witch. She's like she steals her own sister's boyfriend, you know? So she's, yeah. Last night they did a, um, a charity uh, fundraising online Hocus Pocus Sanderson Scissors special. Oh, yeah. That we watched that was pretty fun, where basically all of Bette Midler's friends did like little bits um, for this special. Nice. And it was hosted by Elvira. So there was lots of. Oh, nice. Folk. Um, but they brought back um, most of the cast of of Hocus Pocus to do little bits and stuff. Yeah. And my favorite, Billy Butcherson, played by Doug Jones. Yeah. He got back in the makeup. He did. He put the and whole. And he yeah. he 
romanticized the way that uh, Sarah and Winnie fought over his his loins. <laughs> So See, horny, good. horny. It was very horny. Yeah, it was very horny. horny. I watched some pretty horny movies too this week. I'll get to get around to that. Go for um, it. But um, no, the, the, my next one, my next day was uh, I did. There was a home invasion day, which was pretty cool. Um, there's a couple of movies I saw that were were, were pretty pretty effect. I mean, like really like effective home invasion movies. I watched Hush, which is kind of has like the twist of this, this, this deaf writer woman who's played by Kate Siegel from uh, Haunting of Hill House, uh, which it, it, like, I mean, it's directed by Mike Flanagan, so. That's her husband, so yeah. Yeah, right, exactly. And I, that's, that's how I learned that they were, and now I kind of uh, hate Ma Mike Flanagan, but. That's besides the point. <laughs> oh, did you learn the story of his uh, of his first wife? Is what you learned? No, I just the fact that he's married to Kate Siegel and she's oh. like disgustingly hot. Yeah. Um, well, this isn't the only uh, yeah uh, cast member that he's been married to. No. So oh really? First movie, Absentia. Absentia, which is one of my favorites because it's really horrifying. Anyway. He he made with his then pregnant wife. Yeah. Whoa. <laughs> And then they got divorced. And then I guess they got divorced, and then he he got with Kate Siegel. with Kate Siegel. Right. Well, so they the, he directed, and they actually co-wrote this movie Hush about this deaf woman writer who lives like in the middle of the woods for some reason, and um, <laughs> and she gets attacked Hi. by uh, you know a, a crazy guy. Um, I liked that there was a kind of a little bit of a twist that his like preferred murder weapon was a crossbow, which was kind of cool, added some some flavor to it. Um, the one thing about the crossbow that kind of rubbed me the wrong way is that like at one point she steals the crossbow from him. She can't load it because she's not like strong enough to pull the string back. Yeah. And there's like a whole like several minute scene of her like trying over and over. And it's like like you're going a little too hard on the look how weak this woman is thing with her trying to load this crossbow i mean i don't know i wonder i i've seen the movie and i don't know if it was about making her look weak versus making him look ridiculously strong yeah so that i mean he was so slight that when she does defeat him yeah it feels like even more of a victory yeah that's you know i mean i think it's like that's, that's, that's true i think that like it is kind of like realistic a little bit more realistic i guess that like someone you know i mean someone who's a little bit like you know smaller might not be able to to fuck around with a crossbow because that's like, crossbow, but we'll see. <laughs> it's, it seems like it's like pretty intense but I liked I liked the deaf representation. Um, I've read a few things about like you know deaf people were not super pleased that they didn't cast a deaf actress yeah. to play this character. But I've read some 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 commentary from deaf people that like they actually really appreciated the representation. Um, she didn't you know she didn't get the 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 kind of intricacies of being deaf down exactly like her lip movement or whatever and she switches between different forms of uh, sign language I think but like you know it's imperfect but I think it's really cool to see you know and she uses like her deafness to her advantage at the end to kind of get the guy like with her that alarm that super yeah. loud alarm that she has um, so that was pretty cool um, Another uh, home invasion I did was The Invisible Man. I really enjoyed. Um, yeah, that's a good I Kind of, at the, I, I didn't like the ending at first, but I, I read the director's explanation and I think it was just my kind of, you know, seeing it from a perspective of like, you know, MRAs and incels and shit, like I can imagine them being like, oh, you know, legal justice wasn't good enough for this woman and she had to go and like murder this guy who fucking may or may not have been guilty of whatever, but like the director kind of had a totally different, it was like, 
more just us, uh, uh, the reality of like justice doesn't go far enough. And she had to take justice into her own hands because the legal system doesn't go far enough for women that are victims of stuff like this. So I appreciated that. Well, I think it's also just, I don't know. I feel like in the story, I mean, I guess we talk spoiler, um, spoilers, spoilers. If you're listening to this and don't want to hear spoilers for Invisible Man, even though it's been out for like two years, yeah. whatever. No, it came out this year. Oh, uh, what? No, it came. We, oh, that's right. It did. Spoilers for this film. If you haven't yeah, sorry. It, just <laughs> skip over this part of me talking. Um, the guy slashes her sister's throat i don't like to look at i mean i understand that movies like this they're dealing with real life issues and they're dealing with real life issues of abuse but there's always a level of things that i think a film can do that i don't think would be appropriate in real life right like if, i don't care who she is it would not be appropriate in real life for her to go and slash that guy's throat and i don't care what twitter said right. where it's like yeah kill him kill him like because I, I can't, I don't know, like, I guess for me um, to get slightly political, because this is a slightly political movie, yeah. um, if you're into like a cab and abolish and defund the police, you can't be running around saying, and slash the throats of everyone, because like those yeah. are antithetical statements. Right. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, if you're into abolitionism, you can't be running around saying like vigilante justice, because that's not what abolitionism right. is. But anyway, who cares about that? Because, you know, it's it, whatever. But, it's my point is, but my point is, in a movie, you can kind of get that emotional catharsis that you couldn't really right. get in real life. So for me, the guy literally kills her sister in front of her in public, frames her for the murder, tries yeah. to drive her insane. It's a point where, and, you know, she goes there. And I think, I wonder, and I question, if he had truly just confessed everything that he had done, would she have killed him? You get what I'm saying? Mm, if yeah. she had gone to him and, and he had said, yeah, you know what, you're right. I did do all this stuff. Whether or not he was remorseful or not, just like, just to be like, I did do all this stuff. I did Like it. he almost sort of did. There's that one moment where he says the word surprise. Yeah. Uh, it's like, He's basically admitting it without like being being honest about it, but just like playing with her head not. about it instead. Exactly, and that's the problem is that he's never going to truly right. comprehend that what he's done is wrong because in his mind, everything he does is justified. And yeah. I think that's the moment for her where she's like, okay, you gotta go. <laughs> like, right. like this is not a move, this is not a, a story about justice anymore. This is a story about revenge. I'm going to, and I think just, for once, she wanted to outsmart him. Mm -hmm. Because he had spent so long out trying to outsmarting her and taking advantage of her and hurting the people she loved. She it's just it's it's in essence, it becomes a, a vengeance movie. Yeah. She just really wanted to be able to just say, it's over, it's done, yeah. he'll never come back. So I I completely understand the ending. I don't yeah. think I completely understand it and where it it's a, it's a it's a like a metaphor it's a movie so it's like metaphorical justice it's a metaphor for the legal system is never going to go far enough for this woman based on these extreme circumstances like it it's totally um excusable that she would take justice into her own hands in this way and in these he, extreme circumstances and also just story wise he continued to create this thing where he was the victim somehow. It's right. In, it's infuriating. It's infuriating to the point of you just lose all of your moral compass and are like, I'm just gonna fucking kill you. Just, <laughs> like, yeah, fuck I this. can't yeah. deal with you, you asshole. Like, right. you're just donezo. Yeah. <laughs> all right, spoilers over. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Um, and then, so actually the movie I wanted to talk about the most on my home invasion day, invasion day and I pro I'll try to keep it a little uh, closer, but um, I saw Mother uh, directed by Darren Aronofsky. Oh, we oh, haven't seen we it. We haven't seen that yet. Oh, you haven't seen Mother? Oh my God. I, damn, now I don't know how much I can say. Uh, 
I'll just I'll just keep it sort of surface level and say this movie just like the rising tension of it and also like it's just such a, a beautiful like creative twist on the home invasion genre and as an introvert this might be the scariest movie i've ever seen in my <laughs> fucking life just like oh my god it's so infuriating how this guy just keeps on like uh yeah i don't want to give away too much because it's it's so so good um, but it also kind of struck me as this metaphor of like how it feels to be a woman in this country and like the whole world is all up in your business all the time um, and taking that to like the extreme of extremes and just like doing it in such a horrifying and deeply unsettling way and it's just so so well done I love it I love I, I am this with this movie. I am officially realizing that like I need to go out and seek out and watch every single one of Darren Aronofsky's movies because every single one I've seen, I've loved so far. I love The Fountain is like a theological masterpiece. Um, the Wrestler and this movie and fucking just like so many the noah i love noah i know that's not a movie that everybody loves uh but i loved it and um i really want to go out and see uh pie and requiem for a dream and uh what's the other one i haven't seen uh black swan dream is, is i think that's a horror movie i think that should count as a halloween horror movie because that yeah but it's like a horror movie that is real and you feel dirty after finishing it i want to take right. thermal showers and cry in the shower <laughs> yeah. that's how it feels so that was my home invasion day what about i'm gonna throw it back to you guys for a little bit um as far as affecting movies that we've seen um for this month um on the 23rd was a a shutter event joe bob's halloween hideaway Nice. And uh, he showed this movie Haunt that's available on Shudder that is a new it's, it's only two years old um, it's from 2018 I believe and it's uh, we watched a bunch of Haunted House movies but this was the best of the Haunted House movies that we watched um, it's basically about a bunch of kids that go to a uh what they think is a haunted house for some charity or something and as soon as they get there they're greeted by like this like creepy clown creepy clown in like a plastic face mask and like all of the people that work at the haunt wear these like very crude like almost like 50s-esque like plastic face masks and there's nobody like communicating with the kids but they decide to go in anyway and the movie's really good about keeping track of like their cell phones and like making their cell phones a part of the plot um and it's just like it feels very uh very of today but also very like classical horror as well yes because it feels classical horror because sometimes i feel like kids do things in modern horror they would never do really <laughs> like okay. i'm not saying there aren't children taking risks but i'm just saying like the concept of the story is there's some weird extreme haunted house in the middle of nowhere <laughs> and then they go there and there are like three cars in the freaking driveway and they want to take their cell phones and these kids are like, sure. And they don't make them pay any money. And they, they make them sign like okay. a waiver and put they their address. Like, but they don't make oh them God. pay any money. And they're all like, sure. But you know what? At the same time, McKamey Manor is a place where people just get tortured for seven hours. And it's free, except for like the payment is dog food. And tons of people go to that. So I, I don't know. What do I yeah. know? Maybe people right. are dumber than I think. I just yeah. like. It's just the middle of nowhere. I, I would just turn around immediately. <laughs> one, of, one of the best things about the movie that I'll spoil, because I don't think, like, just the, the concept of it 
doesn't seem that alluring or interesting mm -hmm. um, on the outset. And I've passed this movie on Shudder like a hundred times mm -hmm. and been like, oh, I don't want to watch that. It seems boring. The, the way that the evil characters look underneath their masks is so much more horrifying than the mask than the mask they wear and like nice. they're basically like like freak sort of that's all i'm gonna say but it's so fucking cool and i love horror movies i've realized this month that uh that have like one scary element and then they like can can unpeel themselves and mm. have like an even darker horror underneath it like 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 the first scary thing is their way of being like a facade of normalcy mm -hmm. and the deeper scare yeah is really that's a very scary. like stephen king does that a lot where he'll have like like a lot of his stories are like mostly like the 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 world that he builds is mostly the same as ours except there's like one really like weird supernatural detail to it mm -hmm. that kind of makes the whole thing unravel. So yeah, so I watched Haunt for Joe Bob's Halloween Hideaway. Um, and we also watched Hack-A-Lantern, which was not that great. Mm -hmm. um, oh, Hack-A-Lantern. It was, it was just pretty, pretty silly. It was, Hack-A-Lantern is a movie directed by a Bollywood director. Oh, doesn't wow. understand the American concept of Halloween. <laughs> so, right. like, for whatever inexplicable reason, there are fire dancers and a, a guy doing stand-up <laughs> comedy in the middle of the movie for five minutes. <laughs> There's all this bizarre, random stuff, and it's just like, why is this happening? There's something kind of great about that, though, this idea of, like, <laughs> misappropriation in reverse. Like, someone from outside of our culture taking something from our culture and just totally, like, not getting it at all. <laughs> it is a night of comedians, right? It's yes. a night of comedies. <laughs> yeah. It's for fire dancing. Yeah. Um, and then in the vein of, of Halloween comedies, uh, we had a day that was a uh, trick-or-treaters and we had already used up so many movies that have <laughs> trick-or-treaters that have trick-or-treating yeah. in them that we were like uh oh what are we gonna pick and so we put on netflix's adam sandler film brand new this year hubie, oh, halloween. God. hubie halloween which i'm shocked to say was better than i thought it was gonna yeah. be i can't believe it I actually laughed at it and I, it actually had like a, a cogent storyline throughout. I, I was fucking shocked. I haven't seen an Adam Sandler comedy in like a decade. Yeah. Yeah. And the movie opens up with Ben Stiller reprising his role from Happy Gilmore as the <laughs> mental institution worker. Right? Mm-hmm. And just on that alone, I'm like, all right, I already love this movie. This movie's great. It was, it was very silly, but it was actually surprisingly, yes. Like, and he, when I tell you he brought back everybody, so like he brought back yeah. Rob Schneider, he brought back um, Steve Buscemi. Steve Buscemi. He brought back like everybody he's ever worked with. Oh, happy Madison family, of course. Yeah. And the, yeah. the only weird thing about the movie that Danny pointed out that I thought was interesting is like, why does Adam Sandler have like this obsession with like children beating up somebody who is like probably Spe autistic? Yeah, probably special <laughs> needs of like, some kind. Uh, like he really he does. Why is it all of his move all of his comedies are a person who's way older than the, the people that torment him, who yeah. probably has, in our world, would be diagnosed with some sort of like special needs or autism right. spectrum issue. And he's like, you know, it'd be really funny if little kids threw rocks at that <laughs> character. <laughs> Just like, and uh, he dodges those rocks. And he dodges those rocks. Oh my God. But it's just so funny. Like every one of his characters, like Waterboy, like all of mm -hmm. Yeah. It's all the same. 
Halloween. Mm. <laughs> it's all the same. But this time it works. Hubie Halloween. You guys should check it out with it, the kids. It works. And yeah. Hubie really does get his day. I think that Hubie really gets, he gets his day. Whoa. Yeah. It's fun. There's a bunch of kids with like scream masks torturing him and stuff. It it's also cool. t- it takes place in Salem. So it has like really fun over Halloween-y element because everyone's really into mm. Halloween. I like, I really did. I enjoyed it. I, it was funny. And I, yeah. Unexpected. Nice. Sweet. Um, let's see. I had the next day I had was Demon Day, which was a lot of fun. Some of it was a lot of fun. Um, the first movie I watched on Demon Day was like the best possible way to start out Demon Day. I watched this movie on Netflix that I've been meaning to watch for like a couple of years now, I think, that it's been on my watch list. Uh, it's called let me see, pronounce this correctly. Eramentari. Oh, okay. The Blacksmith yeah. and the yeah. Devil. Yeah, I've seen that. that movie, I've it. Have you guys seen it? No, I've been meaning to. Oh, it's it's awesome. Uh, it starts out a little slow, but and a little bit dry, but it gets so. Fu- I mean, they just totally like go for broke with like the demonology. And like the fucking the makeup effects and stuff, and like the ending of that movie. By the time it got to like the point where it was like almost the end of the movie, I was literally like, "Oh my god, please do the thing, please do the thing that I think you're about to do," and they fucking did it. And that's one of my favorite things when I watch a movie is when I'm like, "Come on, do, do, the, do, do the thing, do the thing." Like the ending of uh, Have you ever guys ever seen that movie Knowing with Nicolas Cage? Yeah. The ending of that movie. That's what I'm talking about. Like, please do it, do it, do it, do it. And they did it. And it was so good. Oh my God. Um, And then from there, like the total opposite end of the spectrum of what could be called a demon movie. I then watched Hereditary, which man, I, I am in the past (laughs) week, I watched Hereditary and Midsummer. And I am just like completely blown away by Ari Aster and his talent and vision. This man's vision is just unbelievable. Yeah, his brain. Like, I want to like pick his brain because I'll I'll get a little bit more into it when I talk about Midsummer because I want to like close on that because that movie just like blew me away. Um, But Hereditary, just like the slow deterioration and the, the like an actual like decent portrayal of like mental illness and trauma in a horror movie which you don't get that like horror is kind of shitty about yeah. mental illness and it does it so well in this i was really like i was really surprised by the performance by the the kid who plays the son because mm-hmm. the only other place I'd ever seen him before was in that Jumanji remake. <laughs> and I thought, I thought he was just like some kid that they got and he was like, whatever. He wasn't like a very good actor at all. But in this movie, he's fucking great. Well, I have, a really, I have a really funny story about that. Um, oh, yeah. So, well, because, okay. In order to get that performance, and let's let's name the actor, so Alex Wolf. Yeah. In order to get that performance, he went like super extreme method so he kind of abused himself to get that performance and there's kind of a hilarious quote from tony collette because they were talking about his performance and the movie with her and she was like well you know you know alex really like went through it to get to this movie he really went method and i just you know i don't do that but you know he's young (laughs) he's famous shaded him so because because basically he got like he was so method that like sometimes he wouldn't talk to the other actors because he was like trying to like be in it all the time and yeah. you know and tony collette's been doing this for a long time and tony collette's like i'm not gonna beat myself up for a fucking movie like i'm getting paid to do this i'm having fun like moving on but like it was just kind of, like i know that she didn't mean it in a mean malicious way it's just obviously like this kid really went through it like he went through it to get this promise yeah like, is really great for the movie but she's right like it's an unsustainable model i remember talking right. i was going on like a whole rant about method acting and how 
We were talking about this on the podcast. At yeah, one point. it's unsustainable because yeah. it's just like, if you were a theater actor, you couldn't, and I think that's the thing too, Tony Collette's done a lot of theater. Mm. Um, and so it's like, it's unsustainable to be a method actor in the theater. You couldn't starve yourself. Anyone, and, if anyone is qualified to say that, I mean, based on Tony Collette's performance in this movie, like Jesus fucking Christ, holy. Movie. I can't believe she didn't get nominated for an Academy Award. I'm gonna tell Seriously. you right now, it pisses me off to this day. Unbelievable. To this day. That monologue at the dinner table, okay, is iconic. It's iconic. Even like the early mo, like her in the in the support group, just like running off the litany of like how fucked up her life is. Like even before she starts to deteriorate, like she's so she's such a great actress. Like she, she uh, I don't know if she's ever won awards for anything. Probably, like I don't know. But she she deserves so many awards because she is like a a singular talent in this industry. The one thing about this movie, we rewatched it this month too. We watched it on Hail Satan Day. Um, nice. The the scariest thing, even though there's like so many scary, horrible things in the movie, still one of the scariest visuals is just like naked old people slowly emerging oh from God. the shadows. And appearing to you, yeah. like no, 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 no. There's there's so many layers of horror to the to that story. Yeah, because if you take it as just the horror of like familial tragedy and trauma, it's already horrifying, and how yeah. it's, how it's inherited and almost genetic. And then if you take it as a straight up horror movie, what her mother did was monstrous. Like that, she sacrificed her daughter's children to the. Mm. Like, it's so fucked up it's so fucked up like yeah. it's so messed up oh my god it's so creepy it's just yeah. so many levels of creepiness to that movie that's 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 one of many movies that i watched this month that i'm definitely going to be watching at least a couple more times and are already have a place on my like all-time favorite movies list because man there's so mother is another one like and i I'll get more into Midsummer, but like, there's so many movies I watched. No, that, like, well, I want to go through like each, all of my like theme days and kind of, you know, go through it that way. Um, so I'll like just finish out the Demon Day. The rest of it was kind of unremarkable. I watched that that movie Lights Out that yeah. I kind of wasn't. I mean, it was effective up until the end. Um, it's better than the short. I, I, I thought the black light was a cool touch, but I I really wanted more empathy for Diana and not to just have her be just this like malevolent evil presence. Yeah. But to be like she was a she was a mentally ill child and now we're gonna just make her into a demon. And then the ending where like I mean I don't wanna you know spoil it's a four year old movie, so I guess I don't need to spoil too much. But like the ending with the like the ultimately like how the mom finally gets rid of the demon is horror like you're just gonna fridge her like that like that's yeah. fucked up and like the treatment of mental illness in this movie is just like really it's left not, back it's not great mind. yeah yeah total total polar opposite of the treatment in hereditary like just really not good so wasn't too pleased with that um my next day was what was that day i'm looking at the movies i saw i didn't write down the theme uh, oh, it's Teen Scream. So Teen Scream Day, I watched um, the Slumber Party Massacre, which I was pretty excited about because it's like an 80s slasher, but directed by a woman. And it got me thinking about, it felt like this movie was not in full control fr from its director. Like there was so much male gaze in this movie that was directed by a woman. Like I was kind of like, I don't know, maybe they have to do that. Maybe it's not even just influence or it's, they, they, like well, you just- they make a movie with producers people. and all kinds of people too. And I'm sure they're telling them put more titty shots. Yeah, in it just like kind of felt like not much, like a kind of a nothing movie. It, it reminded me a little bit of Prom Night in the sense that like you see the cult killer full flush like from the beginning which like eliminates all the mystery around this person. Like you see their face and you see them moving around like in full, you know, everything. 
Um, the metaphor of him using the drill and the drill being kind of like a metaphor for his cock was, you know, kind of cool in a feminist way, but um, it, it, it just didn't do a lot for me. Um, a movie that did do a lot uh, for me on uh, Teen Scream Day was I watched uh, another movie directed by a woman. Uh, we need to talk about Kevin. Yeah. Directed by Lynn Ramsey. That movie is excellent. An incredibly powerful film about motherhood and like this sort of universal like uh, sort not totally universal, but like this idea of in in parenthood where you know, you feel like your kid just hates you no matter what you do. And it's, it, it drives, it like, and this, and you know, taking that to an extreme for this movie, it drives her completely mad. And like the, I love that how focused on the mom this movie is because they could easily could have focused on the creepy kid, but it's all about the mom. That was one thing I really loved about Mother too that I forgot to mention is that movie so intentionally folk like i early on in the movie i sort of called it uh jennifer lawrence's face the movie because it's so the cinematography is so focused on jennifer lawrence and there's so many like close shots so you can't really fully you don't really get a full picture of the like wide angle lens of what's going on and all this like even even when there's like a million things going on it's so focused on her face and that's such a great decision in terms of making sure that the audience never once strays from experiencing this from her point of view yeah it's like always yeah, it's, it's just not nearly as terrifying if you're not experiencing it from her point of view yeah and the same thing for this movie we need to talk about kevin like it's all about the experience of the mom and like her deterioration as her child grows up and like continues to hate her for no reason. It, it, it's almost supernatural in a way that like she can't do anything to make this kid not despise her. And it's like so powerful and haunting. It's really, That's really cool. interesting to me that you interpret it that way because I, um, I actually kind of interpreted the misanthropy between them is mutual. Like, really? I kind of felt like she never wanted to have a child. And I think that that little boy sensed it. Yeah. And so it sort of became an end. It was an end. Um, their relationship had antipathy from the very start. Cause, and I'm not saying I blame her. I'm just saying that I feel like, I think that's kind of the, the, the supernatural story is just sort of like, the supernatural element of it is that I almost feel like they had like a psychic link where they both sensed each other's mm. absolute disgust with one another. Yeah. Especially when you juxtapose how she treated her younger daughter. Yeah. Versus him. It was almost like she wasn't ready to have a kid when she had him. And then when she had the second one, she was far more prepared emotionally I don't know. I I didn't interpret it as just her. I didn't yeah. I didn't interpret it as just the kid hating her for no reason. I kind of always got a sense that she just didn't want to deal with him. I don't know. Yeah. And that reflected in their relationship. I, mean, I I definitely like that that feels more in line actually with the the movie itself. I don't know. I I I didn't fully get the sense that you know, she really didn't want him from the beginning, but I think that that's that that your reading is a little bit more within the text, maybe in a way. Um, I just, I mean, I kind of, you know, my mind kind of just went to that. Like, I mean, that's such a that's such a common, you know, feeling of parenthood of like, you know, your kid just hating you for, mm -hmm. and you just don't understand why. And she and like and part of it is like she she really makes an effort at least yeah. early on in their lives. She like tries really hard to like get the kid to like love her and you know say her name and you know like play ball with her and stuff. But I think I think you may be right about that. That especially because I, I kind of look at it like I look at it like she, she even if 
that's not, you know, even if that may not be the, something that people read, I definitely feel like she at least herself feels that way because of the way that she continues to self-flagellate. Like, mm-hmm. I don't know, it's, I think there's a lot of complex ideas going on. Because yeah. obviously there's that idea that everyone blames her for why her right. kid went mad and did what he did. And I don't, and obviously I'm not saying that, oh no, it's all her fault. No, I, I just think that like, there's there's a lot of stuff going on in that story about the question of whether or not like, you know, sometimes people have kids and, and parenthood and like what it means. And, but I, I don't know, like, especially like when, you know, she goes to the grocery store and like they smash up her eggs and she literally goes right. home and eats the eggs full of eggshells. Another person would never have done that. But it's like this sort of like, penance that she keeps paying about this concept and i don't know if is it is it justified is she really looking back and going you know man like this kid had to have smelt on me that i just wasn't i wasn't with it or is it like you know he was just a monster like that i think that's the thing the movie does the movie raises questions of like is it nature versus nurture is something but like, I don't know, I kind of feel like there's, I think that there's meant to be a little bit of both in that, yeah. so that it's not as simple as it's nature, he's just monstrous, it's nurture, she's just a terrible mother. I just think it's like, how can one, how, you know, and, I, and you understand her perspective, like how it's very difficult to love somebody or something that is just fighting against you with tooth and nail like you know what I mean like like, it really gets to her when he's just like a kid and he just won't stop crying all the time as a new mother she just couldn't deal with like it just broke you know and and it, it raises the question of to what extent can she be held responsible for this kid's actions and then tacitly raises a broader question of to what extent can any parent be held responsible for their kid's actions? And it leaves you, it doesn't answer that question for you. It makes you think about it. It, it, It's purposely neutral on on that question so that you can kind of decide for yourself, like how, how responsible was she? How responsible are any of us for the actions of our children? And that's that. I mean, that's a really cool thing for for a movie to be able to like stick with you in that way. Um, and the rest of so the rest of my teen screen day was was pretty pretty fun. I did Near Dark, which was another another really awesome female directed movie. Really fun vampire west. I, I it was interesting. I I, I kind of got the sense that. To me, this was more of a love story than anything. Did you guys kind of feel that too? They were trying, but I just thought it was kind of a weak sauce. What? The love story aspect of Near Dark. Yeah, they were going for it, but it it struggled. I just thought it was just a weak love story. Like, Yeah. yeah. I feel like thematically, the core was this relationship between these two characters. It was, but, but I just kind of feel like they didn't they spend didn't enough time to develop it, like at the beginning. Yeah. Like it's just like they w- spend one night together. I guess they're trying to do like a love at first sight kind of thing. But yeah, but yeah, and then like most of the rest of the movie is just like fun times with uh, with vampires. You know, just going around gleefully killing people, which is fun. It's super fun. Um, but yeah, it wasn't, I wasn't super impressed by it, but it was, it was a fun movie. Um, the one thing that I wrote that, that, uh, that I was thinking about as I was watching the movie was there's the big truck, uh, truck scene where, um, what's his name? Bill Paxton is like climbing on top of a truck and they have to like blow him up. Mm -hmm. And that's the only way to like take him out. Yeah. And I'm like, these people have been around for hundreds of years. They've caused fires. Okay. Yeah. And they never blew each other up. Yeah, like right. they they was their family once bigger? Like <laughs> yeah. you gotta think that they knew that blowing up right. was a was a weakness here. Okay. Yeah. Before totally. getting involved. Yeah. No, and that's then, true. Yeah. 
And then just it thinking felt like about, it was just kind of a way to end the movie, you know? Yeah. And then thinking about movie truck drivers, we watched uh, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Oh. I, I saw it for the first time, yeah. Yeah. Which, what did you think, Danny? It, yeah, it was still disturbing. Like, I was eating food. I was eating most Oh, no, bad idea. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was eating a bowl of cereal when we got to the part with the dining table, and then I was like, oh, I can't eat any more cereal. Oh, my God. No, that's the worst part to be yeah, eating. Yeah, like, I don't feel good. Like, I was just, <laughs> no, but it, it it was really, yeah, it was still, it's still a very effective movie. Okay. It's still really gross. But at the end of the movie, this black truck driver stops to help her, I, okay? He's and then gets out of the truck? And he gets Why out of the truck. Why does he get out of the truck? Get out of the truck! I'm leather face with a wrench. <laughs> then she gets away on the back of a pickup truck. And then he just runs down the street. He's still, he's still he's in place. Why did he go back to the truck? I, <laughs> he's I, gonna die. I never understood why that happened. I, I, I don't understand. I was like, seriously, that's the thing for five minutes. I'm like, why does this man get out of his truck? It kind of seems like his truck door was protecting him from the chainsaw. It was. <laughs> so I kind of feel like maybe you should have just stayed in the car and driven yeah, right. away, dude. And now he's gonna die, and the movie doesn't yeah. care. The movie's like, the white girl got away. It's okay. It's all right. Kill the truck driver. But uh, all is forgiven for that final sequence of like the ballet of Leatherface like yeah. flailing with his chainsaw. That was so beautiful. I, just, I think that movie is just harrowing because it's this actress just fucking losing her mind for 20 minutes. Like this mm -hmm. amount of screaming that she does. Like the level of psychological torture before she's ever yeah. physically tortured. Yeah, like it's, it's like, just oh no 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 like that scene with grandpa. Oh my god, I was like, this the, is awful. This such is a perfect, like the psychological torture of them like trying to make a dead person hit yeah. her with a hammer and he can't really do it. And she's like waiting for it to happen and it kind of doesn't <laughs> really happen. And then finally he actually like hits her, but not really that hard. Oh my God. So it's awful. Terrible. It's awful. Like it really is. It's very harrowing. And I just, the thing I love the most about that movie is it doesn't, it never feels like a movie. It just feels like these things are just happening. Like yeah. it doesn't, it doesn't build tension to release it. It doesn't do any of the things that you think of a horror movie doing. It just shows you this horrifying thing happening yeah. and, and lets you kind of immerse yourself in it. And it's so raw and visceral. And then oh. I love that at the beginning, you get like this thematic the moment. Disclaimer. You get like, the, no, you get, you get a thematic moment where this character's talking about like the cattle industry. Yeah. Right. And how they put down cows and how they treat cows and like the people can't even stand to hear or hear or listen to it. And they don't want to hear about all these gruesome things. Yeah. And then this whole movie, these people are just treated like human cattle. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Like, just and especially perfect. with like when they pick up the hitchhiker and he's talking about like, oh, the bolt gun, that's that's no good. It's the hammer was better. Yeah. It was like, yeah, the, the the more inhumane way is clearly the better way. Yeah, like, you know, obviously. <laughs> so we got to watch that for a day that we had that was uh, themed to poor teens. I, fe nice. I felt bad because I totally said, you know, if they remade this movie, I could totally see, I, I, even though I love him, I could see Adam Driver playing the psycho hitchhiker. <laughs> oh, yeah. He for sure. He the fuck out of that guy, but I was like, but I don't want him to do that. <laughs> yeah, right. He would He would kill it as that guy. He, he really would. would. He would horrify me. I could, Seriously. I possibly my crush would end at that point. <laughs> <laughs> I doubt that. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> There's no, there's no level of disturbing he could be that could uh, break you up. No, nah. probably, not. probably not at this point. I'm in it for life. Um, so oh, we're both on our teen days now. So yeah, we're on, we're on teen days. So we also watched um, 1981's original My Bloody Valentine, which was good. Oh, cool. Which is really a good slasher movie. Yeah. Like, which is really a rare thing to say. Um, but like, well, Danny, Danny, especially you're uh, you're not a slasher person, and you it no. seems like you like this movie too. I did, I did like it because I think it just I I I I like 
I think that's my my thing is that if I watch a slasher movie that kind of turns it on its head, so like you know, it takes place in a mining town. Mm-hmm. It's just got a very different feel to it, you know. The pickaxe. Yeah. Yeah, there's murders by pickaxe. It deals with like small town, like mining politics. Like it just is a totally different visual look than what we're cool. used to. And then since it's all themed around Valentine's Day, there's just constantly ripping out people's hearts. Yeah, that's another thing that's kind of cool. Nice. It, that it takes it doesn't take place during Halloween. It doesn't take. You know what I mean? It's not in the fall. It's like February. Right. <laughs> it's like oh Valentine's Day. Yeah, that's a cool thing when, like, you know, like, t- when a when a movie can do fun things like that with setting. Like, I remember like watching the the Hills Have Eyes, the original, and like loving the fact that the the climax of the movie takes place in the morning because it's in the desert and it works because the morning in the desert is like scarier than night almost. You know, like you could fucking die from heat exhaustion. So. All right, let's let's speed things up. Yeah. So I so my other teen scream I did uh, Nightmare on Elm Street two, which I thought was it was an enjoyable sequel. I like the concept of Freddy trying to like inhabit somebody from the real world so that he could go into the real world and kill. And also, I love that there's some pretty like some pretty significant queer themes in this movie. Like I really feel like the ki- the kid and his friend are like sort of jilted gay lovers that never really got to like explore that and there's the 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 the, the coach who's like part of the you know goes to the kink club yeah, and I, yeah so i thought that was cool and i also watched um the black coat's daughter i don't know if you guys have seen no. that one it's really good it's kind of like an anti-exorcist um in the sense like it's a possession movie that's like not like not at all pro-Christian and like actually like has more of a more of a like amicable relationship between the possessor and the possessed Hmm. and it's actually it was written and directed by Osgood Perkins who plays David Kidney in Legally Blonde oh wow which is pretty cool yeah uh but yeah definitely like a, a very very like sense of dread type of movie and I really like the twist ending. Um, I don't want to say too much more about that, but I really yeah. like that one. Um, I'll let you go for a little bit, and then I have two more movies, and that's it. Okay, so we did, in this home stretch, we did a lot of rewatching of things that we've already seen, gotten to nostalgia mode. Nice. Um, yesterday, uh, the theme was Werewolf. <laughs> and uh, we, we, we rewatched An American Werewolf in London, which is always fantastic. And I've never seen that. Up. <gasps> oh, oh, you got to see, see it. it. You got to see it. Got to see it. I'm not a big werewolf person, so if, if, if it's that good, maybe it'll change my mind. If there's one werewolf movie to watch, if you're not a werewolf person, it's American Werewolf in London. It yeah, I figured. Be. Yeah. And it's amazing because there's still parts of the movie that you know that are graphic and violent and like crazy that like i've totally forgotten so it i got to re re remember it's kind of it's kind of got like black comedy elements to it as well so it's not just a straightforward horror but it's it is a horror but it's not just straightforward like there's there's something very darkly funny about it and then we watched uh the wolfman 2010 starring benicio del toro in his dream role as a werewolf (laughs) Um, which it's actually a really fun movie. It it's it it plays sort of more super heroic. It's than, more like a Marvel movie than other werewolf oh, yeah. movies. It was directed by Joe Johnson, the guy who did Captain America, the first oh. actor, yeah, and the Rocketeer. But it, it definitely does have more of a Marvel because it's you can tell they worked really hard to have a werewolf versus werewolf fight. <laughs> they were yeah. like. We're gonna do it, and then they did it. And Anthony Hopkins uh, chews the scenery and is really fantastic in it, as yeah. he is in any gothic movie. Um, we also just felt like watching Scream Two yesterday, so we watched <laughs> Scream Two, which, which holds up well. I don't know if that has anything to do with werewolves, but whatever. It doesn't, but since the Mandalorian came out, 
and uh, Timothy Oliphant was in it. And yeah. Timothy Oliphant is the killer in Scream 2. We did, yeah. We, there was a thematic connection in my mind. Nice. Um, we also watched Scream 4 because we could barely remember it. It's pretty bad. I yeah. remembered who the killer was. And I think that's because... I, I don't know if I want to give it away. No, don't give it away. Don't give it away. I think it's because it has one of my favorite kinds of killers. That's all I'm going to say. But okay. it it's just like, it's the Scream movie that like, I don't know, just the way it opens, it opens with like a bunch of like fake openings. Yeah, the opening uh, of other movies. It's the it, one where, it's the one where Scream, the parody of horror movies becomes a parody of itself. Yeah, kind yeah. of, yeah. It's it, it it just doesn't find the line, and it's never scary. I tried to tell him I think everything after Scream Two isn't worth it, really. Like yeah, not like Scream Two is the last decent one. Have you seen the like MTV TV show? No, we have not. But we 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 talked. It, it, I wouldn't be against checking it out. I would, yeah, I would check it out. But I'm just worried if Scream 4 is any indication as to what <laughs> this decade thinks of Scream. Yeah. And now they're doing a oh, Scream okay. 5, and I don't even know what that's going to be about. Yeah, right. Doesn't sound that fun. No. Um, we had a Hex and Curses day, and we watched uh, Drag Me to Hell, which is one of the best Sam Raimi like movies. Like rewatching it, it actually is like an extremely tight delicious story nice highly recommend that um i also watched the ring which as i've said on previous podcasts i'm not the big fan of the ring but i did enjoy the ring more oh, this time than finally I got ever him into the ring had before yeah. so good job linda cast <laughs> ring is just i don't know it's just a, i lo- i still love that that and i like the remake more than again the, the japanese it's version. just that really if do. you if you're not willing to make the logic, the the break with logic leap, that you have to be in for afraid of a VHS tape, okay? <laughs> if you make that break with logic to leap, that I'm gonna be afraid of this VHS tape. You're not afraid of the tape. You're afraid of what's on the tape. But as as the movie says, it's very student filmy. Okay. Yeah, it is. It is. Oh, yeah. I, but I love that moment. I love that moment where he they meta make fun of themselves because yeah. like because i don't because i think that also adds to the element of it's not meant to be it's meant to be it's meant it's just a series of her memories all dark and twisty mm. so like yeah you could look at that t- and i think that's what's more scary is you could look at that tape and go what is this it's just a bunch of gross shit i've seen this before i don't care and then you will care because yeah. you're gonna crawl out of your TV and eat your ass, like you know what I mean? Like I, I like I, that moment was so. Is good. that what she does? She eats ass. You know what I mean? Samara eats <laughs> ass. That's the name of this podcast. You know what? Well, yeah. the the uh, the other th- the thing I love the most about the ring is it's like I mean it's 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 so much more family drama than anything. Yes. Like, it has like sprinklings of horror to it. But it's like it's very it's it's just really dark and like unsettling and sad and like it is sad yeah it's such a sad movie and I love the 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 little thematic like touch of that that the shots of that tree yeah kind of over the course of the film I love that um, but yeah it's just it's 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 so much more drama than anything until like you know the climax at the end. And then it just goes full horror, which is really cool. Yeah, I don't know, man. I just, I there's just some things. Maybe because for me, I guess as an audience, as what depending, on, I'm a Western audience. I guess I'd consider like, I just think the these the reveal of smart is just so. The only thing that I don't like right at the end is like the reveal of her face. I mm. think they showed too much of her face. I think they yeah. stuck with the Japanese and just shown her eye. Yeah, um, that w- that's what makes the, the 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 um the Ringu monster a little more terrifying because you just see her eye, but I still think it's just like, I because I guess also too just I watch the movie in the theaters and there's nothing like that moment of when everybody is just no she's not gonna come out of this television oh my yeah. god she's coming out of this fucking oh I, I still remember I, I, I actually it's it, I have a funny story that I was I was like hanging out with some friends at Sunset Place 
And I ran into another friend of mine who was like, hey, man, I have two free passes to like a sneak preview of the ring. And I had I basically like abandoned my other friends because like, how am I going to, you know, like yeah. this is a free, a free sneak preview. Like, come on, I got to do this. And my friends made fun of me for it for a while. But like, I remember remember like that that climax scene like everyone in the theater was just screaming and yelling at the screen and I don't think I've ever screamed louder at a horror movie than I did at that moment where she just like flashes forward yes. oh my god oh my god it was horrifying the first time you see that especially in a movie theater that shit is fucking terrifying yeah no no oh my it, god. it's I think it has like one of the most effective first time watches ever. It's just yeah. so like, what the fuck is going For on? For sure. Yeah, like it's oh my god. All right, so we should uh, we should get to my my last two. I guess unless you have some more, but oh, we're good. Okay, so yesterday I watched. First of all, I watched Bird Box for the first time which I, I really, really loved. Um, I read one article that was kind of outraged about the treatment of mel- mental illness and like suicide in this movie, which I don't know if I necessarily agree. Like I get the, you know, the graphic depictions of suicide were a bit much, but like if you are someone with suicidal ideation, you probably shouldn't see this movie about this thing that just makes people kill themselves. So like, yeah. And they were talking about how the, like apparently people with mental illness are the only ones who like when they see the thing, don't kill themselves and just try to get everyone else to see it, which I didn't fully get that. Like there was a couple people in the movie that I thought like didn't seem like they were mentally ill, but were, you know, like the British guy that comes into their house. Like he didn't seem mentally ill at all, but he, and like that, that was a really like interesting moment in the film because his eyes aren't fucked up the way everybody else's is. So they assume that he's fine and it turns out he's not. And I was like, Oh, I thought, I thought everybody always has their eyes turned. Maybe there's a way that they can like make them not creepy or whatever, but I love this movie and I love I thought this was also a really cool metaphor uh, for parenthood and in, and really like life in general, this idea that in some sense as parents and as really people living in this world, we are kind of blind in the way that we live our life. We like, we don't know what we're doing in this life. We like, we don't know what the fuck is going like. And so, and especially being a parent, like it's got to feel that way sometimes just like feeling like you're like, feeling your way through life and just trying to do your best and you don't really know where you're going or what you're doing. Um, so I thought that I, I really, really liked that movie. Um, and then I watched Midsummer, and I could probably go on and on about this movie, but we don't really have a lot of time. This <laughs> movie, like, I'll, I'll say this. I was so as I've been kind of going through and watching movies, I've been kind of like placing them in like an all time top. I'm going to try to get it posted by the end of the day that I'm doing what did, what Danny did uh, a a little while ago, doing like a top 40. I have to do my top 10. I got distracted. My top 10. Oh yeah. Um, And I, after I watched this movie, I was kind of looking at my list and trying to figure out like, where do I put this on my list? I ended up putting it number one. Whoa. Because this movie, to me, is like this generation's 2001 A Space Odyssey. Like, Damn. it's it's just pure, like, place. pure poetry. And, like, just so much of this movie goes beyond words. And, like, it, it and it's an intentional, like, thing, you know, like, they, 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 the, 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 the kind of central unifying factor of this cult is this sort of expression of feeling in a way that goes beyond words, the way that they vocalize pain and the way that they vocalize with the, the, the constant singing and all this stuff. It's just so artistic and just the vision of Ari Aster in this movie. This, 
I don't know how, like the, the vision is so detailed and like everything is just so, and it's just so beautifully rendered and the cinematography and everything about this movie just like really made an impression on me. It just, it's just, it's pure art. And it just like, it, it, it just blew me away. Um, yeah. And it, it's, it's, I think it's, I think it might be officially like my favorite horror movie I've ever seen. Cause it's just so. I feel like with his movies, it's always good to get a second viewing. I haven't rewatched Midsommar. Oh, I want to watch it a bunch more times. I haven't sure. rewatched Midsommar, but I need to. And I feel like, I don't know. I just, yeah, I think though when you watch it with the perspective of cult indoctrination, it's really effective in that way as well. And like, yeah, I don't know. It's, yeah, there's just, the opening sequence I think is like some of the most disturbing moments in film. Just like, man. And then the way that they just make you feel so uncomfortable all the time yeah all like like with her interactions with all these men and stuff yeah and like watching her come into this group dynamic mm-hmm. like the way that they makes you that uncomfortable early on i think is is really what what makes you feel all the horror so much later you know and it's kind of a genius premise to have them come into this space and like you know they once once they're in this space and you kind of see the kind of inner workings of this cult like it never leaves you wondering like what does this mean why are they doing this what is it like because it doesn't really matter like it just like it 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 makes it doesn't make sense but it makes sense you know what i mean like it's just like this is what's happening to them and you don't really need to know why any of this these people are doing this or like it's just and it's just so visually striking and and like aurally striking and just like just so yeah i could i i I could really just like go on and on and on And and it's all built on the same repetitive trope of like american kids are gonna go on and have a fun spring break yeah but they won't yeah right and like um, the ritual, like the way that it, that it, like, I, I was really amazed that like this movie's two and a half hours and it never, I never was like, oh my God, this movie's so long. Like it, if, you, if you're going to make a movie that's two and a half hours, you better make every single second of it super engaging. And I really felt that throughout this whole movie. I, when I first watched it, I felt a little bit. I felt some of the drag, but only for a, a moment. Like once they got into the community, I didn't feel the drag anymore. Mm-hmm. I just kind of the, the transition from them, from her losing her, you know, her family to them going to the the community. I kind of felt a little bit of drag in that moment, but like, but yeah, no, I don't know. I, I think that if I rewatched it, I wouldn't feel the drag anymore because yeah. now I understand like the, the unfolding of events. But um, I, I really, there's some things about it that I found so disturbing just because like I've been, now I've been watching like the Nexium documentary about oh, the yeah. cult. That guy and, just got like sentenced or something like that. Yeah, Keith Raniere just got sentenced to 120 years in jail. Nice. So, um, <laughs> so uh, they're, you know, they talk a lot about how they indoctrinate people into the cult and how they get people brainwashed and i think the one sequence where she's crying and they all start crying with her yeah it's really horrifying because it's like they're not really feeling what she's feeling but they're 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 trying to they're mimicking yeah but they're only trying to as a way to worship her pull her in but a way to pull her into their cult yeah you know what i'm saying it's yeah. all it's all a facade like and these people are brainwashed too so it's it's that's the thing it's it's like it's a it's it's generational brainwashing but my but my point is is that it's like they don't understand they think oh this is a way we worship this is the way we but but it's all a way to just for her it seems like they're sympathetic 
but they don't really get what's going on inside of her. It's just that she's been so desperate for anyone to truly care about the shit that she's been going through. And her boyfriend is, because he doesn't want to be her boyfriend or her emotional support, he's yeah. in such a, a wall of neglect. Yeah, but That's why they're able to kind of suck her in. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I actually, yeah. it's, I know like I, I, when you first watch it, you're like, oh, you know, wow, they're really like helping her. But then you realize like, no, this is like part of the whole yeah getting her fucked up into this cult so by the end she's like yeah (laughs) put that down i I really i mean that that the the whole like vocalization of like other people's like screaming and stuff like that i feel like it's also sort of this like almost like forcing themselves to have some sort of catharsis yeah like like vicariously which is so disturbing yeah and like, like uh, the other thing about this movie that makes it so disturbing is like you know as you're going through this and like the the visuals are so pretty everyone's in flowers and flowing gowns and and that makes the incredibly brutal violence yeah so so much more when it's juxtaposed with all this beauty and like the natural beauty of the setting and like their architecture and everything and then all of a sudden these people are walking off of a cliff and bashing their faces in and it's like what the fuck did I just see and like the way that all of our characters react to it differently some of them are kind of like a little bit nonplussed and then there's those two others who are like what the fuck is going on here and it's like yeah why aren't you guys reacting this way um and there was something else but yeah and it's kind of no and it's 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 creepy because it's kind of like this normalization of they're like everything's gonna like they already start on them like this is part of our culture and this is thing and generational and da 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 da. and the one phd student who's writing a paper is kind of like nonplussed or whatever and it's kind of like because he thinks oh yeah this is just culturally but it's like but culturally it's horrifying and and i think that's another thing that's really cool about the culty aspect of it they make the worst things try to seem normal right like when you look at nexium and uh, you exactly uh, they're just part of our culture yeah it's just part of our culture it's totally normal to never sleep and not eat and be Keith Raniere sex slave. And it's the same kind of thing here. It's like, it's totally normal to like have weird group sex with like 10 people with like, you know, and it's normal to jump off cliffs and to kill people and stuff them in bears and burn them alive. Like it's totally normal guys. Yeah. It's just part of our tradition. And I, I really do think that he does a great job of like, of making you understand like that's what cults do. They mm. normalize the worst shit. Right. Because it's all based off of this group think that exists. And, and Annie's uh, in such a vulnerable place that she gets yeah. sucked into all of that. Absolutely. And I think I think one of the probably most underrated parts, I've actually seen people say uh, the opposite, in fact, but I didn't feel that way at all. I think the 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 core of it, like the the the, all these characters, the main characters are so real. I felt that like when they step into this world, you know, they, they make such great avatars for us to experience this horror through them. If the characters were more two dimensional, I don't think this movie would be quite as horrifying. And they, they continue to develop that too. When like you have that scene, there's there's all these like interpersonal dramas be going on between them. Like when the when the boyfriend decides that he's going to do his thesis on this, and they have this whole argument, you know, him and him and Chidi, because um, that's what he's totally Chidi in this movie. Like that's that's Chidi, that's a hundred percent. But like, and they have this whole like falling out of like, you know, and they, the the tension goes on as they're like trying to interview people and do stuff like in the, and it's, and it it really keeps the human core of this movie so resonant so that you never lose touch with 
these very human characters going through this like almost other world. They're they're in another world. This is this movie puts you in another world through them. Mm-hmm. And if you if they aren't human enough for you to sense how horrifying it is to be in this like completely different world, the movie doesn't work the way it does. And I really love that about it too. Like, like yeah, I just, I, I can go on and on about this movie. It's so good. All right. Well, we should. But we're, yeah, we're, we're running up on time. We should wrap it up. Let's normalize ending podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> I have been your host, Steven. I've been Danny, the cohortress. Happy Halloween! <laughs> <laughs> and I, as always, are, am your non-binary heavyweight champion, D-Rock. And remember, kids, um, check your candy for razor blades and coronavirus. Whip out those microscopes. Start <laughs> figuring out your chemistry because... There's one deadly thing that could be in your food, and then you're gonna get everyone in your family sick. You're gonna start an outbreak. Oh, this is you're gonna dark. start a fourth Damn. wave. <laughs> you're gonna take out half the country. Oh my god! Whoa! So Our last Halloween br- podcast ends in the most macabre way possible. Happy Halloween, kids! Wash your hands. <laughs> Kiss your parents. Good night. <laughs> Hey, Wunder. Hey, Wunder. Wundercast? Give yeah. it up for Wundercast, man. What an adorable name. You're listening to the Wundercast. What's up, everybody? This is JC David Frank, Green Ranger. You're listening to Wundercast. We got it. to the Vondacast.